Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all our participants who have joined us worldwide and our Indian participants. On behalf of ISGF, I welcome you all on the fortnightly webinar series on the short list of climate actions that will work. This is the third webinar in series, and uh, today we will be discussing on HVDC reconductoring and smart ball supercharge grids. A short list of climate actions that will work is a set of material Mr. Michael Bernard has spent 15 years developing, researching each major problem area and proposed solutions for it. Mr. Bernard assesses each with the triple filter of technical viability, economic uh, competitiveness and human acceptability. Trillions of dollars will be spent on decarbonization in the coming decades. Much of it will be spent unwisely and much of climate action must be taken in nations that are not developed and affluent yet. Countries that embrace and lean into the short list will be more affluent, more resilient, healthier, and coincidentally do more for climate action. Countries that don't will suffer significant economic headwinds in the coming decades. In the first webinar of the series that was titled Electrify Everything Everywhere All at Once, Mr. Bernard presented the reasons why electrification is the best route for decarbonizing. And the recorded version of this webinar is uh, available on our YouTube channel and the link is given. In the second webinar of the series that was wind and solar, but what else? Mr. Bernard highlighted the likely end game mix of electrical generation on grids globally, characterizing generation types, including co-benefits. While wind and solar will dominate, they have, uh, they have different aspects and dependencies. And the recorded version of this webinar is also there on our YouTube channel. The link is presented in front of you. We will also be posting the links on the chat box. As we electrify everything everywhere all at once, the grid becomes a critical path item. Can we get enough electrons to cars, buses, heat pumps, and industry? How much energy will uh, we lose when, when we transmit wind and solar a thousand or more kilometers from where the wind is blowing and the sun is shining to where people and firms need energy? Are we using our existing grid effectively? Or uh, how will the wires overhead deal with increasing heat? Mr. Michael Bernard will provide insights into the answers to these and more questions. Uh, before uh, we dive in into the webinar, uh, some home ground rules are there for all the participants. Uh, all participants are requested to be on mute. And please do not turn on your videos or your speaker while uh, while the presenter is talking or presenting. Uh, so that will be uh, that will help us to to uh, uh, to be uh, to to do the webinar smoothly and participants are also advised to send messages or questions in the chat box only we will be taking all the uh, questions in the end now moderator of our webinar is uh, mr reji kumar pillai president india smart grid forum and chairman global smart energy federation and presenter is Mr. Michael Bernard, founder, The Future is Electric. A quick introduction of Mr. Pillay. Mr. Pillay is the president of India Smart Grid Forum since the inception and also the chairman of Global Smart Energy Federation. Uh, sir is an internationally renowned expert with nearly four decades of experience in the electricity sector in diverse functions, covering the entire value chain and across continents. And Mr. Bernard is a respected authority in the field of clean energy, sustainability, and electrification. With a wealth of experience and expertise, Mr. Michael Bernard founded The Future is Electric to promote the adoption of electrification as a sustainable solution for our energy needs. 
uh, his insights and knowledge make him a valuable guide in navigating the complexities and opportunities of electrification across industries. So without any further ado, uh, we will start with the webinar, uh, HVDC Reconductoring and Smart Balls Supercharged Grids. And I would like to hand over the stage to our moderator, Mr. Reji Kumar Pillay. Over to you, sir. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants from around the globe. Thank you very much for this third edition of uh, this webinar series on climate action that should work. So, the, uh, as I had told in the introduction of the previous two, uh, the cost of uh, repeating, I would like to reiterate that most of the studies says 2 billion machines that are today running on heat or fossil fuel will get converted into electricity. So electrification of this 2 billion machines around the globe in the next three to four decades would require tripling of our electricity capacity and all the new generation resources which are going to be mostly solar and wind. And how do we make them? from millions of kilo, uh, thousands of kilometers away from the load centers, the solar farms and the wind farms, what electrons are produced, we have to make it available to the load centers, to the electric vehicles, to the factories, to the offices, to the industry. So many places we need to build new grid. The, uh, as I already <coughs> told in the previous webinars, the BNEF estimate of November 2023 is that we have to build about 80 million kilometers of transmission and distribution lines at an estimated cost of $21 trillion in the next 25 years, which is a very, very tall target and at the same time, huge business opportunity. Uh, I would like to take a minute to talk about what India has done. We have about solar plus wind put together, we have about 135 to 137 gigawatt. And most of it is built, uh, wind was built in over the last two decades, but most of the solar built in last one decade. So, uh, which is close to 90 gigawatt. We have been very successful in evacuating power generated from the large solar farms and wind farms, which are in the northern, western, and southern parts of the country to any part of India. We have more than 100 gigawatt of inter-regional power transfer capacity. That's a transmission planning which India has done. So we operate 800 kV HVDC lines, 500 kV HVDC lines, and 765 kV and 400 kV AC lines, which are the backbone of the India grid, which covers 3 million square kilometers, connecting over 300 million customers and operating in one frequency with a total installed capacity close to 430 gigawatt. And what we have done at the time when we looked at uh, a big ambitious plan for renewable energy development that was some 10 years ago, we looked at ev for evacuation of power from large solar farms and wind farms, which are more concentrated towards the west and north and southern part of the country, some eight to ten states. Uh, we have to build high capacity transmission corridors. So we call them green corridors. The first phase of green corridors we completed, the second phase we are doing. And these green corridors are not the regular transmission lines because we have the government of India has given viability gear funding. So some many of these lines may not be running at full capacity 24 seven because solar generation and wind generation, the capacity utilization factor is in the range of below 20 percentage. So Power Grid Corporation of India, which is a government owned company, uh, majority owned by government, it's otherwise on the uh, uh, stock market. So Power Grid Corporation of India planned and built these green corridors, mostly 400 kV at some places, 20 kV uh, transmission lines and substations, bringing them, uh, connecting the wind farms and solar farms to the main uh, polling stations, major substations, for which uh, Government of India has given viability of funding. And this as a major step 
a visionary step taken by India, the, the, the power grid planners and operators. In So we don't have much of curtailment. In fact, almost zero curtailment of power evacuation from wind farms and solar farms. And another thing which we have done is we also set up renewable energy management centers. This REMC, we call it renewable energy management centers. They are equipped with uh, sophisticated tools for weather forecasting. And they are helping our system operators to forecast generation from solar and wind uh, more accurately. So typically what they do, they do a day minus two. So today what we estimate is for Saturday, what is the gen uh, generation from each of the solar and wind facilities on Saturday, we estimate today, give it to the uh, power system operators and tomorrow with better data, weather data, we fine tune it. And during the day on Saturday, we will do intraday mitigation measures. As I said, 3 million square kilometers is operating as one grid. Larger the control area, the better it is for uh, addressing the changes in the uh, generation pattern according to the weather, changing weather. So this is something which we have done much better than many of the developed countries and power system planners and operators are most welcome to share this uh, Indian example. So uh, without uh, taking much of your time, I will hand over to Michael who will take uh, you through today's session where he'll be talking about HVDC. India started with HVDC way back in 1989 and first HVDC by Paul and back to back uh, station was commissioned in those days, about 30 years before. And uh, I, I, I mean, ISGF and our Rado says we have been talking of late about the SCADA, the SCADA systems which you have, it measures only the electrical parameters. That is not enough. With a changing weather pattern, we need to measure the physical uh, dimensions and the atmospheric conditions as well it need to come into the our SCADA systems. So uh, maybe uh, later uh, I would request, uh, after Michael's presentation, I would request uh, one of our advisors and uh, uh, working group chair, Mr. Ravi Sidabadi, he's also incidentally based out of Toronto in um, Canada. Uh, he's on the call. I will request him to talk about five minutes about what are we talking about, the new generation of SCADA where physical parameters and weather parameters will be added in addition to the electrical parameters. That's where the work, latest work is going on. And something about the smart bolts, Michael is also going to talk about it, how we in real time monitor the temperature of the wires and then accordingly load that. So over to you, Michael, for an interesting session. Thank you, Reggie. Um, as always, thank you to you and the ISGF for uh, Enable, uh, allowing me to share what I can to assist India in this uh, marvelous journey and so on. Um, so, getting right back to the basics, um, as we consider electrification, right now, you know, you, there's many places where we have a bottle of gas sitting beside a house, and that's providing cooking heat and, you know, stuff like that, hot water. Uh, we are not going to have that in the future. We're going to have heat pumps that require electricity. Um, and, and we have to think about the grid as an incredibly fractal thing. We think about this massive transmission network, some of the stuff that Reggie was talking about with the green corridors. And then we get down to the, just the high, high voltage distribution lines. Then we get down to the local lines. Then we get down to the lines and buildings. It, it spreads out like the roots of a tree. Um, and it requires that it has the same heartbeat. It requires the same frequency. It requires reliability. It requires the same voltage. Um, when people plug something into the wall, it, the, the wall plug just needs to work in order for this transmission to work. Um, and that's very, it's not trivial to do, but it's provably easy to do with renewables. Uh, if we take uh, Denmark and Germany, Germany especially because it's a more highly populated, more industrialized country, they're over 60% of electricity from uh, renewables these days, and they have a grid reliability of 13 minutes of uh, outages per customer per, per year on average. Uh, and so that's kind of a level set. Uh, if we look at North America, it's averaging about two hours of outages per customer per year. If we look at Kenya, it's much worse, but 
it's all entirely possible. There's nothing about renewables that prevents this. The stuff that Reggie was talking about, about the two day ahead, weather forecasting across broad geographical regions to enable grid planning decisions and merit order stuff, that requires transmission. And so I'm only going to be talking about the top layer of this, the, the transmission today. Um, and, and there's some really basic value propositions about broad grids. Um, if you have a, ne a narrow constrained geography, like one of your states, and you only did grid planning in there, and you only did renewables in there, well, you'd need more renewables and other forms of low uh, carbon generation in order to balance that, a greater percentage of those per capita. Similarly, for storage and other backup, you need more backup and storage if you're con geographically constrained. Similarly, other ancillary services, uh, frequency and voltage management. But as you get to that concept of continent scale grids, like all of India and India Plus, then you actually balance these things out. You find an, op an optimization where you are trading off transmission for generation, for storage, and for ancillary service management. And so you can find that optimization. I'll talk about a study out of Africa that talks about that. And it's similar to the studies that India has done, but it, it means that we have to look at some of the older studies, especially. A lot of them were constrained to near geographies, like a, a US state, and said, well, obviously renewables won't work because they'll be very expensive because they intentionally constrained the geography. So we have to think bigger with renewables, as Reggie points out. So this diagram is from the uh, Global Energy Interconnection and Development, Co Development and Cooperation Organization, GIDECO, G-E-I-D-C-O. It's a China-led, China-created and China-led organization with 141 member states, overlap significantly with the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. The ISGF is a member organization in GIDECO, as are hundreds of other organizations um, that focus on electricity and the grids globally. Uh, and what they propose is truly a global grid. Um, they talk about their, their grid planning is very large. And you can see India, you know, is got the solar power, the wind power bases, the hydropower bases, and it's connected to the rest of Asia, East and West conceptually. And this is the way we need to start thinking about it. Oceania um, down here in Australia um, starts being connected into Indonesia. Right now there is a HVDC project called Sun Cable that is expecting to bring electricity into Singapore here where I lived for a couple of years, um, simply because Singapore is the richest of the uh, ASEAN nations by far. It's a tiny nation, but it's incredibly wealthy because of the way they structured that up. Um, and so the get rid of pop up here. And so as we look at this, you know, what we start seeing is, oh, well, when India is looking at its wind and solar capacity, as in this two days ahead, in the future, it'll start being able to have conversations with um, Eastern Africa and Central Asia and the ASEAN nations to start finding ways to supplement, to share excess electricity during the day and to supplement peak demand periods from farther abroad. Uh, I, I like to put it that HVDC is an pipeline. And it's, I also say it's the new oil tanker and the LNG tanker. Uh, as one of the data points on that, uh, we have uh, last year we had about 911 super or very large crude carriers, the biggest um, oil tankers in operation. And they last only about 25 to 30 years. So in any given year, you'd expect 25 or 30 of them to be on order, but only one was on order. The maritime shipping industry knows that oil and gas is going away. You know, and 40% of uh, the bulk shipping is of fossil fuels. We're going to be displacing a lot of that with high voltage direct current transmission, uh, but not nearly as much energy per unit uh, for the simple reason we can generate a lot more electricity locally. And, you know, I'm just going to say countries that are, um, are poor in fossil fuel resources, well, they still have the sun and wind. And so they can generate a lot more locally. Secondarily, the point of electrify everything everywhere all the time is 
an electric pathway to electric uh, renewables to electric energy services is vastly more efficient than fossil fuels to any services. You know, it's three to six times more efficient to use electricity directly to do something than to use fossil fuels. So we don't need as much energy to deliver the same economic and comfort value, and we can generate a lot more of it locally, but we still have to share some across borders. And HVDC is the mechanism by which that occurs more than not. Um, just for context on HVDC, uh, you know, India is, you know, as you can see, got a tremendous number of projects there, but it's a global thing. Um, HVDC is literally everywhere. High voltage direct current was, um, you know, originally created by ABB in Sweden. First installation was uh, 19, they just had the 75th anniversary of it, I think. So, you know, to give you a sense of how old that was. Um, and a lot of it was built on the old um, LCC stuff, where it was just big, massive plates that were converting the between two AC sources. So they're back to back conversions. One of the first first uses of um, HVDC was to say, okay, we've got a grid region here with one frequency and a grid region here with another frequency. Let's put something HVDC here to have an asynchronous transmission of power between two synchronous grids. And so that you can avoid having to frequency match. Um, and that's a very useful purpose. You know, because we look at Japan um, over, over here. Um, a lot of Japan's HVDC is back to back stuff. But now we've got uh, VSC, which is basically it's digitized the signal matching. So it's a very efficient mechanism that is much more efficient at moving between grids and moving between um, frequencies. So that's one of the key advantages of high voltage direct current is it doesn't care what the frequency is on the other end. The transformer stations match the frequency at either end. And we're starting to see tremendous efficiencies of this. Another advantage of HVDC, we're starting to see the point where in, um, one of the biggest, um, biggest transmission lines in China, 1.5% um, losses over 1,000 kilometers. This is a tremendous efficiency for transmission. And it's viable because just like high voltage alternating current, the more juice you put through a wire, the better it is in terms of its efficiency to usage um, bandwidth, all else being equal. And so we've got big pipes in India and they're, they're proving what can be done. They've got um, 12 gigawatt connectors coming in from the Three Gorges Dam into the demand centers over here. Uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of potential with this technology. Um, lots of stuff going on there. And as you can see, uh, to Reggie's point, um, India has more high voltage direct current than all of the United States, like a full 50% more. And India has done a much better job than North America and mostly Europe about the green corridor transmission concept about you know the, the number of stories out of the developed world about interconnect queues that are a decade long for new renewables projects is indicative that the Western world lost track that the grid is absolutely essential to this transition. Uh, good on India for not losing track of that. Um, you know, uh, Reggie talked about its, um, you know, the plan there. We've got the basic regions, lots of interconnect work has been done. Uh, lots of different, you know, talked about 400 kilovolt. We're now starting to see 1.2, uh, 1, 1,200 kilovolt um, and two gigawatts as fairly standard for interconnectors. So for HVDC, we're starting to see it really ramping up in terms of scale. Um, when I talked to the uh, head of HVDC for DNV, the global firm which does um, standards for HVDC for all of energy systems for uh, shipping, for pipelines, and, and for transmission, he's saying it's kind of like becoming two gigawatts is the standard now. Um, and you know, we're starting to see bigger and bigger because HVDC is not limited in the same way that HVAC transmission is. There, you know, the high voltage alternating current, because of the way the alternating current works, little eddies uh, show up in the um, transmission, and they mean that more and more, the, it's only the skin of 
the line that has electricity flowing through it. With HVDC, it doesn't have those effects. So the entirety of the conductor, the entirety of the conductor's three-dimensional space is actually conducting electricity. Uh, tremendously useful in that regard. Uh, further, HVDC generates a lot lower electrical fields and so interacts with its surroundings a lot less. And as the part of the main reason it has um, much lower resistance than uh, HVAC, especially underwater or underground. Um, you know, one of the reasons that wind farms are, uh, offshore wind farms are all connected with HVDC is because you don't lose nearly as much to resistance because the magnetic field is interacting with the water and the cable is passing through. Um, so India is doing a good job. It, it can do more and it will need to do more because as Reggie said, there's a lot more power that has to go through these things. Um, you know, and so India is maybe a, ahead of the game in terms of starting that expansion because it was nicely, because it's leapfrogging. This is one, another place where India is leapfrogging the West, but it still has a lot more to do. So I put this together um, just to give a, a bit of an idea of some of the constraints. So I looked at the depths of the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal uh, to see if it was possible to connect easily to Malaysia and to Indonesia, and it's not. The Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea are very deep bodies of water. And, and right now we are putting HVC subsea cables down to um, you know, quite significant depths as low as, as much as a couple of kilometers. Uh, but the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea are very deep bodies of water, as you probably know. And so, uh, you know, my initial thought was that, but the point here is that there's an opportunity for bigger, broader backbones, um, you know, that India, you know, to get further out to India and to get into the ASEAN region. Um, this becomes viable because while India is a big country, I think seventh largest square kilometers in the world, it's not a wide country. It's longer, it's <clears throat> longer top to bottom than east to west. What that means is that eastern sunshine is not that different in terms of time zone, uh, time of energy than, west, than western sunshine. So you can't move electricity from sunshine as easily as the United States can, as China can, because they're broader countries, as Canada can. You know, we have um, five and a half time zones in Canada, for example, you know, it's, it's a absurdly broad country. Um, we also have all of our population within 150 kilometers of the US border because the rest of the country is very cold and full of biting insects and large bears. It's mostly in, inhospitable and empty. Um, so what I suggested is get over here to Oman, then you get into the African grid, and that's a viable depth for there. Get over here into Myanmar, You've already got interconnectors into Bangladesh and Nepal. We'll be growing those, but you know, grow big connectors east and west at the top, get down to Sri Lanka, and then you can start sharing the resources more globally. Um, you've got a more of a, um, as the previous slide showed, you've got connectors between the grid regions, but you don't have a big one going all the way from top to bottom or, or east to west right now. And I'm suggesting that's something to think about when we talk about grid in the future and the future electrifying everything, we really have to think big. And, and here's an example of thinking big and something that is an opportunity. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a group of researchers, Chinese and African uh, energies researchers published a study um, which looked at putting H a big HDDC um, backbone, 12,000 kilometers across 12 countries from the sub-Saharan Western Africa across into Ethiopia and, you know, fairly affluent Kenya, then down that coast into affluent South Africa. And what they did is they modeled out a mix of generation capacity, both fossil, um, you know, legacy fossil, but also renewables and other stuff and amount of grid storage that they would put across this interconnector and have it flow north and south as generation opportunities occurred, east and west as solar opportunities occurred. And what they found is that they, you know, mixed grid, uh, a mixed set of generation across those grids 
was quite reasonable economically. Um, but there's a problem, um, and I'm not sure India has solved this problem, so I hope somebody will share with this with me. Um, they had to, they were using European developed software. So this is an African Chinese initiative under guide, you know, with Guideco and Belt and Road eyes on it, um, which gives it some strength for potentially happening. Um, but they had to force the software to do unnatural acts because most of this grid management software and grid planning software for analyses of these types is really constrained to a country or one of those regional grids. Like, and so it's difficult to get software now. And it also had limits in terms of the types of storage and limits in terms of the types of um, you know, generation that you could put on the number of units of generation. It's like SimCity, if anybody ever played SimCity. SimCity was really, I, I just found it distressingly simplistic in terms of the options for electricity and stuff like that. And, and even the most sophisticated software struggles with this breadth of software. So I, I know that there are people working on this. We, it's certainly not a computational problem, but it does require working hard to figure out what that really broad vision is and how you're gonna interconnect into it. Now, my assertion is 45 of 46 sub-Saharan uh, country, sub countries in Africa, that's 45 of 55 total countries in Africa, are members of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, China is the global leader. India is doing an amazing job, but uh, as always in these cases, when we look at China, it's mind-boggling how much they've built. They have their own HVDC technologies. They have their own HVDC cable plants. They have their own BSC technologies. And of course, every major player like Hitachi bought ABB. ABB built HVDC initially. Hitachi bought that portion of, HV, of ABB a few years ago. And Hitachi has manufacturing facilities in China, as well as in the United States, as well as in Mexico and, and um, um, Europe. And you know, so it can avoid some concerns about Chinese technologies. The, the point there is that China's technology is probably going to be dominating in sub-Saharan Africa because that's part of the Belt and Road, new customers for Chinese technologies and locking in resource uh, value propositions, especially for the resources of the future. You know, there's a reason that China has a lock on about 80% of processing of all battery minerals because the Belt Initiative went in and developed the countries that had those battery minerals so that they could extract them, share the benefits with the local region, and move on. So this then becomes a key pathway for um, Sub-Saharan Africa becoming affluent and also becoming a region for India to connect with to share electricity across broader east-west pieces. That Ethiopian sunshine could be powering New Delhi's nightlife. Um, and similarly, nighttime electricity in uh, India in 15 years could be powering Kenya. Uh, so there's a really interesting opportunity to start thinking more broadly around that stuff. Uh, and you know, just uh, evidence. Uh, on the other side, this is an older um, cable. This is an older chart from uh, the SuperGrid organization. You know, once again. You know, it's talking about how we connect Delhi and Mumbai and Bhutan, the Gobi Desert wind farms, you know, the major demand centers of Beijing and Shanghai, um, and down into uh, Indonesia, the Philippines. You know, these are all very accessible solutions. You know, I talk about China, I uh, talk about Japan. When I assess Japan, it's Fascinating to see how resistant they are to doing the really obvious thing because they have very shallow accessible waters to South Korea to mainland China and into uh, Russia right now, which is uh, I'm, I'm going to say that Vladivostok's a long way from Moscow. So it's less likely to be a bad actor in that regard. But the point is. One of the points of that is geopolitically right now, all energy imports and exports are already at risk. Of global disruption, we saw that with the um, uh, we saw that with the energy crisis in Europe a couple of years ago after Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, but hedging is done for all energy imports now. When we start interconnecting with other countries, 
no matter how fractious the relationship frequently is, I, I believe there's some fractious relationships with neighboring countries and India has been managing for mm, since 1947. Um, and so those fractious relationships don't mean you don't trade with them. Um, it does mean that when you look at an interconnector for electricity, which is benefiting both, enabling more communication with both, providing economic value for both, uh, you do want to hedge for potential for that connector to be turned off or turned down. Just as Nord Stream 1 and 2 were turned down by uh, Russia early in the war and then you know somebody blew them up, I, I still think it's Russia, but all the investigation is not being able to say it was that actor. It was a state actor of some sort is the best conclusion this studies have come up with. But hedging for disruption of your energy services is just something we do now and something we'll continue to do in the future. Um, now, that's kind of big picture, but what about transmission we already have? Um, India is built a lot. It has a lot of high voltage alternating current um, and it has a lot of HVDC and they have operating parameters. Well, here's a really interesting thing that's occurring now. So historically, uh, transmission lines have been a core of steel strands because steel is strong, surrounded by strands of aluminum because steel aluminum conducts electricity really well and is light. The combination means it doesn't sag too much um, and it transmits electricity. Um, but there's a couple of problems with that. One is both steel and aluminum sag more when they get hotter. Um, and further, the aluminum is unannealed in legacy transmission stuff. As it gets hotter, it anneals and its efficiency starts to change. The operating parameters start to change. So now what we have is in advanced conductors, a core of composite materials, carbon fiber, um, which is incredibly strong and doesn't sag, and it's in very light. So it's lighter and stronger than steel. We don't need it to transmit electricity. We need it for the, for the flexibility, but lack of sag. Um, and we want it for lightness. Aluminum is used instead of copper in transmission lines because aluminum is lighter than copper. It really matters when we're putting up pylons and spanning wires across hundreds of meters that the wires be as light as possible. Um, secondarily, we change the way that we met, um, construct the wires with trapezoidal strands of fully annealed aluminum. What that means is if they get hot, they don't change the way they operate. So there's some really interesting stuff that's being done there to do this. And we're starting to see with um, you know, uh, multiple vendors now delivering this in lines, we're seeing some great stuff. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means if we have existing pylons and lower generation uh, in places that are heat impacted, especially, or places where there's wildfire concerns, well, we can replace the existing line with a higher capacity advanced conductor, and we can get twice the electrical generation through the same transmission corridor across the same pylons. Um, further, those conductors will be less subject to sag and less subject to heat extremes causing degradation of performance. So reconductoring existing lines is this fascinating thing where we start to see significant rapid improvement. We already have the pylons. We're just replacing the lines with lines of equal weight but greater capacity. And so the engineering enables us to take to you know boost those things. So all the high voltage alternating current lines that India already has could become twice the capacity. And that's a fascinating concept, potentially even three times. But for new lines, there's another opportunity. New lines, pylons can be further apart because once again, it's lighter and doesn't sag as much. So if you can put pylons further apart, this more expensive conductor combined with the pylons can be cheaper overall for new high voltage alternating current transmission lines. So the combination means we're starting to see replacement of existing uh, alternating current, and we're going to be able to get a tremendous percentage of our new electricity transmission needs just by putting new wires on old pylons. Tremendous opportunity there. And I'll talk about why that's 
really fascinating as well, a little bit in terms of risk. So once again, replace conductors on existing wires with better ones, which are more fire and heat resistant. You know, so as, a, as our temperature extremes increase, as more fires increase, advanced conductors reduce the risk associated with those. But as Reggie said, we've got to know more closely what's happening with those real lines. So uh, this one happens to be from Heimdall. There's a lot of smarter grid components. This is a what they call the magic ball. Um, you know, they, they actually call it a neuron, <laughs> like a brain neuron. Um, and it can, be, it can be deployed by drone. So an operator on the ground has a heavy lift drone, flies up, drops this thing in, it clamps on, it takes electricity from the wire because of in, with inductance charging. A tiny fraction, it's just electronics and has sensors. And it has a heat sensor in there. And so what it can do is say, the line is this temperature right now. And then it has a mesh network, which enables it to send data back to the control centers that are managing the transmission lines. And in some cases, the higher voltage distribution lines as well. Um, that tells the operators exactly what the uh, temperature is, which means they can actually run near the engineering limits as opposed to the rule of thumb conservative limits. Uh, they've actually seen just by putting these in place with some customers up to 30% throughput gains on existing lines just by putting this in place and getting the data back to the control centers. They can actually put more through. In one case, they actually decommissioned, they had a twin lines, they decommissioned one line entirely uh, because it was unnecessary because the throughput of the single line with a more efficient management enabled them to achieve that. Some studies, a recent study out of the United States found that 85% of all new um, electrical transmission requirements could be met by reconductoring and sensors like Heimdall's neuron magic ball. And so where there's robust grids today, they may go from the wrong, they may not be in the right places in all cases, but in a lot of cases, just by making them bigger with reconductoring and managing them more effectively with more sensors on the transmission wires and getting that data in in real time can actually enable them to achieve the end result without building tremendous number of new pylons uh, because pylons are problematic. Um, I want to, I keep touching on hydrogen, so I'm going to mention it here. <clears throat> There's a lot of studies that have been done now saying that hydrogen pipelines will carry a lot more energy than high voltage direct current. And they keep making a bunch of the same mistakes. They mistake um, exergy. You know, uh, electricity can do work, hydrogen can produce heat. Heat is not the same as work. Heat is valuable where you need heat, but where you need electricity and you've got heat, you lose 70% of the heat just because that's how thermal generation works. Uh, similarly, heat pumps are vastly more efficient than hydrogen or natural gas heaters, you know, three times as efficient, um, and you have to put a lot more electricity into that. They also make a mistake saying, well, the pipeline goes from A to B, but there's no great, uh, right now we have pipelines from A to B, transmission pipelines, because we have natural gas fields with massive amounts of natural gas here, and we have a massive demand center here. Well, in the future, this creating green hydrogen requires lots and lots and lots and lots of broad geographical trend, um, renewables assets. Why would we build transmission into the end of this hydrogen pipeline as opposed to, to where the energy is actually needed in more of a mesh grid type of perspective? Um, suffice to say, I've, I've studied, I've published on this a few times. You can look up my articles on Clean Technica to find why the studies which assert hydrogen pipelines are better are flawed in multiple ways. They're, they're starting to get better, but there's some, you know, German group and group think, which is preventing some rational thought and good analysis coming out of Europe. Um, this is kind of my last slide. Uh, this, uh, two, a little over two years ago, um, Ben Flothbjerg and Dan Gardner reached out to me and said, hey, Mike, um, we're publishing a book based upon uh, Ben Flothbjerg's work over the past 25 years. Your material on the natural experiment of nuclear versus um, renewables in China is amazing. We'd like to include it in our chapter nine. And I said, 
well, sure. Okay. I, I didn't actually know who Ben Floatbeard was when they reached out, but I looked him up and I found out that he's a global mega projects expert. He and his team out of Europe um, have been assembling data sets, high quality data sets on mega projects, billion dollar plus projects for over 25 years. They have over 16,000 projects in their data set now. And what they found, what they're able to do, because they captured the um, initial budget, the initial schedule, and the projected benefits, and then they captured the end cost, the end schedule, and the actual benefits across all 16,000 of those things. And they excluded anything where they couldn't get high quality data. Then they've been aggregate, uh, grouping them into 25 categories now. Now this chart is sorted from most likely to hit schedule and budget once construction starts to least likely to hit schedule and budget. And so I did a little call out here. Solar, wind, and energy transmission are four of the top, or three of the top four categories of projects that are most likely to hit schedule and budget and to deliver benefits. You know, they're most likely to be ones in what, you know, uh, Flugberg has what he calls the iron law of mega projects, which is um, only 0.5% of mega projects achieve schedule, budget, and benefits. Well, a lot more of them are solar, wind, and energy transmission than any of the rest. Uh, and as we just, as we think about nuclear, as China thinks about, or as India thinks about nuclear power, nuclear power is third from the bottom, and nuclear storage is in the very bottom. Um, so if we think about no regret options, building transmission between wind and solar assets and wind and solar regions is the lowest risk process going forward. It is the, and that long, reduction of long tail risks, that speed to deliver is fundamental to us achieving affluence, achieving electrification, the benefits of electrification, and achieving climate goals. So that's it. Reggie, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I would now request uh, David Sir to talk a few minutes on the evolving SCADA with the physical dimensions and parameters. Over to you, David Sir. Okay, I thought you may want to take questions first after <laughs> such an interesting presentation. Do you want me to come after the Q&A? Probably better. No, you, you know, you, you could do now and then uh, we'll see Q&A. I didn't find many. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating. That. I was hearing Michael the last time as well, and, and I think it's I think teams and thoughts like this must need to come out to drive policymakers as to where generally sensible work needs to be done. And his last slide sort of captures it. In fact, uh, with respect to the top four, uh, he talks of the Heimdall experiment of uh, you know the neurons. Uh, so in some way, Reji, I mean, thanks to you, you have allowed us to portray the thermal inputs as a necessary and sufficient condition for both transmission and distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, FERC 881 is also calling for this, where they're asking for real-time four-hour forecast of temperature and therefore transmission capability, which would also force some kind of a temperature reading. But if you, if you were to broadly sort of, you know, without taking too much of time into two or three buckets, the first bucket is the ambient temperature rise, and what do we do with existing assets? And the theory behind it is, A, you could just do the thumb rule and depreciate or, or derate everything by 15%, but that would be trillions of dollars of balance sheet that gets wiped off utilities. It'll make them unviable, literally, uh, just in one day. And so the key question is, how do you manage it? And in the last three sessions that our ISUW and distribution utility meet, we've been discussing that we need to manage it. We've got all these assets that we built to yesterday's standards, and we need to manage it. So managing, knowing the thermal limits, whether it's a large transformer, large transmission line, or a distribution line, becomes key to knowing when I have pushed it to the limit and when I should not be pushing it to the limit based on what has occurred four hours before based on loading. So that's one. The second is going forward is as you get more and more renewables, you get volatility in, in transmission and distribution because of the generation that comes up from time to time. And we see that in Western India, where 7,000 megawatts of swing currently takes place at least every other month or every or two, three or four times a year. And so the question is, it has got 
great transmission. In fact, the best in the world, in my view. Uh, every other country doesn't match India's uh, interconnectivity and high voltage transmission. But yet it still requires some of these mitigation techniques to say, okay, when can I boost my transmission line capacity when I have? And when would I, you know, not be, when would I sort of say it is already fully loaded, I should do something else with it, start another generator or whatever. So that volatility is there. In fact, I, you know, because of the renewable energy, at 30, 40, 50% of the total, uh, the volatility continues to rise, right? And so that is a second issue. The third issue is the standards around the world. And I sit on some of the IEC standards, uh, including, you know, how to be climate proof, some of our electrical infrastructure. And it is so slow, I'll tell you, it is so slow that if even 10% of Michael's ideas gets implemented, the standards would not change. It just would not change, and you know that, right? In, in India, we've been asking for BIS to come in and, and actually take some leading role in these thoughts, and there is no thought. So the IEC is struggling with it. You know, in the Canadian standards, I said on some of the CSA committees, is struggling with this as to how to define some of these concepts. And by that time, I'll tell you, the grid, a good chunk of the grid will be built for the next 10, 15 years. So we are behind the eight ball in def defining. So the question, I think, is that if we are able to get these physical inputs, uh, of ambient conditions and, uh, and things like that, then we will be able to much better manage our assets, whether it was yesterday's assets, assets going forward, renewable energy that can be actually added on far more with confidence, and we'll be able to manage it in real time much better. And I think the technology is here. I mean, Heimdall is one of the big ones right now, but we have other fiber optic technologies, right? And, and so, uh, I, I, I advised another one that does fiber optic temperature, distributed temp temperature using fiber optic. So there are several me mechanisms that are is available today at a very low cost that we can actually implement, particularly in transmission lines. And therefore, I think, you know, the time has come to take notice that we need to manage these assets and we need to push these assets as opposed to just saying, you know, let's curtail them, let's curtail them. So I'll stop here, Reggie, and then I won't steal Michael's thunder here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, the one, uh, you and Dave, uh, there are a few questions. Or, you know, I, I could find only one question so far. So it's talking about the difference between DLR, dynamic line rating, and the smart balls. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would classify, you know, urge Ravi to, to join in as, as necessary. Um, dynamic line rating and smart balls, they're, they're part of a continuum. Uh, dynamic line rating basically says, what is the, as Ravi said, what is the ambient temperature? What are the operating conditions we've been uh, putting through the line up till now? What is the actual capacity? What is the sag ratio that is there based upon the temperature? DLR equipment, dynamic line rating, uh, technologies to be applied. Um, and so I, I think someone's raised their hand, uh, Reggie, so perhaps uh, repeat, please put your questions into chat. Um, and so the advantage of the smart smart ball is that it's dirt cheap and easy to install. I think it's about 32,000 per sensor is what I heard US dollars, but it can be done with a drone. So a lines person drives their truck out and she pops out of her truck, she pulls the ball out, she pulls the drone out, she sets it up, she makes sure the battery is charged, she controls the drone, it flies up, it drops the ball on the line, the, bo the, line, the ball automatically connects and locks in place, and she flies the drone down, uh, does a test to make sure that it's worked, and she drives away. And then at that point, a mesh network starts communicating back to the control centers. So it's easy to incrementally apply the magic ball technology with very simple modern technology at very low cost across the highest risk to lowest risk lines where you have the greatest concerns over possible possible benefits i like it for that reason uh, if we start you know talking about putting additional conductor uh, putting additional lines fiber optics across parallel to um, every single line or cross transmission lines that's a bigger ask than just dropping a ball line. So does that mean Heimdall is the best solution all the time? No, not at all. There's a bunch of technologies in here. Everybody realizes, as Ravi was saying, 
we can manage our existing transmission and high voltage distribution, um, you know, quite easily. And we need to do that because that's going to give us, enable us to avoid uh, curtailment. As, Re as Reggie said, India is doing a great job at avoiding curtailment. Um, you know, China has done a great job at avoiding curtailment because they said, oh, well, we need actually transmission if we're going to put renewables on. But that the growth of renewables is so fast. It's so easy to put on a wind farm. We can put an offshore wind farm, a gigawatt of capacity in 10 months of construction now. You know, and that's offshore construction. That's amazing. Um, it just blows the mind compared to the, you know, uh, construction timelines of other generation assets. And, and so that speed and the cheapness of those generation assets is driving a supply curve high. And geographies like India and China are accelerating electrification with, like, for example, the 50,000 electric buses that India plans to have on its roads uh, by 2027. That is truly driving those types of things. So we're going to really be able to manage that. So this is the space, right? Um, do you want to move on to the second question, Raji? Yeah, this talks about uh, can DLR be as effective in high temperature, low wind area compared to cold and uh, windy areas? I, I once again encourage Ravi to chop in, but I would say it's more effective in high temperature areas. Because one of the things, you know, it's the capacity of the line is truly based upon the heat of the line and the sag and the engineering requirements around that. You have to maintain the distance between the line and the ground. You also have to make sure that it doesn't sag so much that it actually just separates. You know, it's it gets weaker as it sags. That's what sagging is. Um, and so in high temperature areas, places where the ambient temperature is high um, or there's fires or something, Throttling that capacity with knowing the exact conditions enables existing lines to last longer to avoid outages. In low in cold areas, well, cold areas, you know, you still get more capacity through, but your ambient temperature is much more generous to the line. You know, you're not getting heat from the exterior. Like in Norway, you know, excess heat in the line gets sucked off into the air quite nicely. Um, around New Delhi, well, maybe not so much. Um, you know, so. The, the wind, that's an interesting one. Um, perhaps we can throw that one. Applications for wind. Uh, Ravi might have a perspective on that. Yeah, actually, you know what? The question is great and it, it helps more in the high temperature, in my view, because transmission lines are considered thermally low inertia. And therefore, even a little bit of wind actually can provide a, a much better effect on its transmission capability than in the colder areas because you already have the ambient working with you. So it is even more important for countries like India now with the CEA thermal map and Reggie can elaborate later. Uh, you know, it is, we need to now build on that to say, okay, you know, how do we get even a little bit of wind that we can recognize allows for the 10%, 5% capability across. The second question I think is respect to across multiple geographies when you have a long transmission lines, you have multiple sensors with multiple temperatures and multiple winds. And therefore, then the question becomes, how do I manage the tap stations? Some tap stations I can probably operate much aggressively. The other ones where I have zero wind or very high temperature with zero wind, I may want to mitigate that in a different way. So whether it's power flow, power flow controllers, whatever that might come later, but by knowing my asset condition from tap station to tap station, I just will be able to manage it better. So the heat, the high heat with low wind actually can reveal much better headroom than cold and heavy winds. Anybody, any other question? I just want to comment on something Michael said about large, you know, especially the last slide. I think people should take away the last slide and, and, and there's probably a much more conversations to be had from policymakers. We, and I don't wish to toot our horn here, you know, in Larson and Tubro, power transmission division on whose board I sit, we install right now, you know, gigawatt scale solar in the Middle East. We have done RAS1, RAS2, all 18 months, 18 to 24 months, end to end. So that scale that we have, if you were to ever go and visit those stations, and Reggie, maybe you may want to have that, I've done that twice. 
And it is amazing that the entire supply chain, the cost met methodology of construction, the digitalization of construction, everything allows, you know, everything to be streamlined and, and, and installed. Two kilometer rows of, you know, solar, solar panels. And so it moves from what I call the old solar installation method into, you know, a bang, 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 you know, literally a much more streamlined way of uh, doing things which allows for lower and lower timelines. So I agree that it is, and, and based on that Middle East, we've got another one in the UAE. We're going to do another one somewhere else. So it is now probably going to be normal in sort of 600 megawatt stations that India did in solar will now be more like one, 1 1.2 megawatt, uh, gigawatt solar plants, uh, which will just become the new normal. And, and, I, and I think that's perhaps the way to go as well, because the cost of power the per kilowatt hour that comes from these stations are even much cheaper than what we can get from smaller, smaller stations. So, already the solar wind generation globally at uh, 3 cents per kilowatt hour, which is set to, by end of this decade, it will be close to 1 cent per kilowatt hour. That will be the cheapest form of energy in human history. Uh, it's going to change everything and storage cost also falling down. Wow. And that enables yeah. hydrogen as well, right? So now where the solar, the Saudi strategy is basically to take the large solar uh, uh, power and then attempt at desalination, attempt at hydrogen, just because the cost of power is so low, right? Uh, and, and But not to transmit hydrogen. I fully agree with Michael. You don't, you, you don't want to be transmitting hydrogen anywhere. Uh, so I've written articles on that for you, Reggie, and you, you would know. The key aspect of it is how do I consume it where I am? And so now it enables it. So low cost renewable energy in on a marginal basis is far, far cheaper than any one of the other fossil plants. And so today's large scale solar, large scale wind is allowing us to go and beat that new low with even newer and newer lows on a, on a PPA basis. And which is where Aqua and others have actually gone and capitalized for their capital financing uh, for large scale solar. Yeah, uh, on that note, I will be, you know, Reggie is insisting that I'm going to do a single uh, one of these discussions solely on my outlook on hydrogen um, and pull through some of the threads there. There's a lot of um, disinformation and, and hype and hope around hydrogen, which are, you know, need to be disambiguated. And so I, I've spent a fair amount of time on that as well. Um, so do, you know, look for that in the schedule. We, we, we will have that in one of the uh, series, one of the presentations. So with that, uh, we are uh, come to the end of one hour. So thank you very much for all the participants and the